Peter, thank you for joining us for another conversation. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, we've known each other a long time. Uh, I uh, unashamedly say I think you did a remarkable job for Australia. You continue making a contribution. But now let's come to some practical things. In the book you wrote when you left the parliament, or at about that time, 2008 or so, you finished up uh, in your final chapter, Unfinished Business, talked about some of the things that looked like they needed addressing then at a time when the country was in a very good place. Water management, closing the gap between indigenous and, and white life expectations and outcomes, um, how we handle our constitutional arrangements and monarchy and so forth. I kind of get the feeling though that it's back to the future. We're almost looking again at some of the big issues we thought the country had resolved. Yeah, look, I think as I look back on the last decade, the, the financial position has slipped uh, enormously. Uh, you go back to 2007, 2008, uh, the Commonwealth Government had no debt. You know, no net debt. Uh, and I thought that would be a reform that would set the country up for generations. Uh, we had money in a future fund, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, we were developing assets, again, for the future to set future generations uh, up a long time into the future. Uh, and it never occurred to me that uh, 10 years on, um, after 10 deficit budgets, we would have got ourselves back into the same debt position we'd been in in the, the, the mid-1990s. The same? Uh, exactly As the same. As a proportion of the economy? Right. So that, you know, everything that our government paid off Every dollar of debt that we, we paid off over a 10 year period has been reborrowed again. We've, we've gone right back to where we were. Uh, and um, we paid off debt with 10 surplus budgets. Uh, since that time, uh, governments of both persuasions have reborrowed deficits with collectively, have reborrowed debt with collectively 10 deficits. So uh, it's been 10 years of surplus, 10 years of de deficit, and uh, it never occurred to me we'd be back where we started. But we are, and it's important that we try and explain why that actually matters. Now, when we were sworn in, you and I were there at the same event, same table afterwards, uh, the term, I don't think I'd heard it before then, intergenerational theft came up. And you and John Howard resolved that we were not going to engage and continue in intergenerational theft. And a so-called razor gang was set up. Mm. Uh, in the first 14 months, I think the five or six of us sat for something like five months mm. of grinding It was gruelling. It was gruelling. My, my set... memory of a long, cold winter in Canberra, actually. Yeah, well, yes. Um, Intergenerational theft, it strikes at the idea that we have responsibilities for the next generation, and yet young people are probably pretty unaware that that was a real concern on our part. Why does it matter? Well, when you think about government finances, um, it is pretty simple. Um, if, if the government spends less than it raises, it's a surplus, it's got money on hand. If the government spends more than it raises, um, it's got to borrow the difference. You've got to get the money from somewhere uh, to spend more than you actually raise. So you, you borrow the difference. You, you, you take out debt. Uh, now, um, each year that it does that, it takes out a bit more debt and the debt accumulates. And if you do it for long enough, over 10 years, you can accumulate up to about $500 billion, uh, uh, which is where we are now. Um, that never goes away. Never goes away. Uh, you've got to pay interest on it every year. And then um, hopefully one day you'll get to actually repaying uh, capital as well. Um, so who's going to be paying that interest? Not the people who are borrowing it now. They're going to be the taxpayers of the future. Who's going to be repaying that capital? Well, not the taxpayers of today, the taxpayers of the future. So the taxpayers of today might be getting the benefit of that expenditure which is uh, paid for out of debt, but the taxpayers of tomorrow are going to be paying the bill for it. Um, and this is why we can sometimes describe it as intergenerational theft, today stealing from tomorrow. This is a very important issue because we've seen in America and in Britain, young people have been tempted to vote 
for grossly irresponsible policies, in my view. Mm. Uh, in Britain, uh, Corbyn, uh, in America, Sanders, promising things like free education mm. and a whole heap of things that would have cost actually those very young people themselves a massive amount in the future. Mm. Well, there's the old uh, adage of Milton Friedman, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, when you say a free education, it doesn't mean it's just dropped from the heavens and costs nobody. Um, a free education means that you may not have to pay, but somebody's going to pay somewhere. Uh, it might be the taxpayer of today, yep. or it might be the taxpayer of tomorrow. So it's not free. That actually pays for it. Mm. Because uh, if the taxpayers of today are paying their own way, they'll be paying for the cost of providing education. But if they're not, if the budget's in deficit, they're not even paying for today's services, uh, they'll be taking out debts which will have to be repaid by the taxpayers of tomorrow uh, to actually fund that. And, and this, is the, this is the thing, um, the taxpayers of tomorrow, they're going to still need their health and their education and their defence and their pensions and everything else. And so they're going to be paying for all their services, but they'll be paying for everything we didn't pay for as well yeah. uh, when they're servicing the debts that we ran up. So, so they're doubly penalised. Um, and this is where uh, young people got to realise that, that they're going to be behind the eight ball. I've, I've always described a low debt policy, a low government debt policy, as a pro-youth policy, right? Because what it says is... Um, if we have low debt, we'll give you kids the chance just to pay for your own services. We won't ask you to pay for your services and ours as well, because that's what debt does. Now, the reality is that around the world, most Western countries, young people's future has effectively been severely compromised, even stolen. I would argue culturally as well as economically, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. by not only huge debts arising out of the financial crisis that began 10 years ago, but also by massive unfunded liabilities. It's the truth that confronts most young Westerners today, their future's badly compromised, mm. intergenerational but, but this is the point. You see, um, if, if you're born into a, a society where the government's carrying big debts, um, you share part of that debt burden. You're, you're going to be asked through your life not just to pay for your own services, but to pay for previous generations' services as well. You're paying twice, your current generation and past generation. And, and this is going to mean that young people will face higher tax bills. It will be harder for them uh, to get ahead. Uh, and, and, and they're coming into a society where they just don't have to fund themselves and their own generation, but they've got to fund one that went before it as well. And this is the difficulty for them. And I, I, th I think it narrows opportunities, definitely narrows opportunities for, for those people in the future. Uh, and it, it does make you know, it's a burden that they'll have to bear, um, a bigger burden than some of us had to bear, and a bigger burden that, that they, they needn't have had to bear mm. if, if our generation had done better. So there's a number of issues that arise out of that, but before we leave the numbers, many people argue that, look, our debt levels are still relatively low. We have nothing to worry about compared to the rest of the world. It seems to me that uh, that's a bit unrealistic for a few reasons, but I'd be interested in your perspective. Well, look, on Australia is 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 still better than, for example, the United States or or Britain. Our 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 government debt is is still lower. Around now. twenty percent federal in net terms. Yes, about twenty percent federal. Compared to yes. America, say. Well, depending on how you measure these things, but America could be sort of eighty. Right? And Britain, the same sort of order. Now, wh why is it low? I'll tell you why it's low, because we paid it all off. <laughs> we, really, yeah. we, we paid it all off yeah. by 2007. So as we went into this cycle, it got 20% worse. Yep. Right? It was a faster build-up than those other countries. Yes. But those other countries went into um, the last 10 years already at mm. 60 or 70. Mm. So when they added 10 or 15, they mm. go to 80 or whatever. So the way I put it is this. We, we had a very fast and bad descent, but we were going down from a very strong starting position. Yeah. Now, here's the rub. Um, after the financial crisis, we, instead of paying back the debts of, of 2008, 2009, 2010, we've continued to accumulate them. We're, we're not paying back any debt yet. So we will go into the next crisis 
from a much more exposed position. Um, and, and the debt that is built up in the next crisis would just add to the current. And this is how debt feeds on itself. If you never get around to paying stuff off, um, then, then it just accumulates bit by bit by bit and eventually gets out of control. Mm. And where do you end up? Well, you end up like Greece. You end up um, like Greece did and uh, Italy's nearing that now uh, where the government just can't service its debts. People don't want to lend to the government anymore. Um, and at that point, uh, living standards just dramatically drop. So it is a reality, isn't it, that uh, before the great financial crisis, that many of those countries' debt levels were very high. There was, see, the one good thing we were doing through the late 90s, early 2000s, when you were in government and I was in government, we were paying off debt, right? Um, George Bush wasn't. No, amazing. Um, Tony Blair wasn't. Mm. All through that period, they, they were, if anything, accumulating. So when they went into a financial crisis, they went in from a higher level and went higher again. Lost control. When we went into a financial crisis, mm. we went in from a very low level of debt. But we won't next time. We won't next and time. And there will be a next time. Look, financial crises are a, a, a regular feature of the global situation. You know, some, some of the academic historians will say, you know, we've probably had something like 200 financial crises since the days of Napoleon. <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite a recurring feature um, and they take different forms. Sometimes they're financial institutions, sometimes they're currency crisis, sometimes it's a debt crisis. You know, in my lifetime, I lived through the Asian financial crisis, a Russian default, an Argentinian default, uh, the, the, the dot com bubble. These things are always going on and always have been going on. The critical thing is this. Are you going to prepare for these crises crises um, by getting yourself into a strong position or are you going to sail into them in a weaker position? Um, because the weaker you are, the worse the damage on the way through. Now let's then turn to the human aspect of all of this because when you've got a tough job as you had as treasurer and a team around you, standing with you, unity was one of the hallmarks of that government, I believe, is one of the reasons we succeeded when others have failed. Very easy for you to be personally misunderstood because you've got to run the tough arguments. In reality, you would argue passionately, and, and, and plainly I'm very sympathetic to this view, that good economic management is good social policy. You run good economic management for reasons of compassion, mm. but we need to think through clearly rather than simply feel our way towards what is going to produce good outcomes for people. Yeah, I'd, I'd argue that strongly. There's a view around that um, a mark of compassion is just giving more money to everything. And it never looks at the other side. Whose money are they giving? Where is that money coming from? What is the consequence of giving it out? Um, let me put it in family terms. Is, is a good parent the parent that just gives their children money um, uh, you know, to, 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 to deal with every problem that the child has? Or, or is the good parent the parent that sometimes says, look, we can't afford this, um, you know, you've got to learn discipline. Um, I, I don't agree with this proposition that giving money out is, is, is necessarily compassionate. Sometimes I think giving money out can actually destroy independence. I think it can um, undermine uh, dignity. Uh, and of course, if somebody else has got to pay the bills, it's, it becomes a problem for them too. So, so you know, I, I, I very much believe uh, that we should be compassionate in our government policy, but it's just all too easy and simplistic to say compassion means giving away someone else's money. You often used to argue too, though, that good economic management meant more jobs, that's a good social policy, and rising incomes. Of course, incomes started to rise in real terms substantially yeah as a result of the economic reforms of that era. A famous um, um, statement by uh, an economist called Paul Krugman, who said, um, in the end, productivity isn't everything, but it's nearly everything. Um, and, and that is, uh, if we're making our economy more productive, you know, if, we're, if we're, we're working better and we're working smarter and we're making it more productive, um, we can all share in the benefits of that. We can share uh, 
as wage and salary earners by having higher wages. Uh, we can benefit as shareholders by having good share returns. Um, productivity rises the whole economy. Yeah. Um, and we had good productivity growth. Uh, now productivity growth has been very weak in, in recent years. Uh, here in Australia, wages have been weak. Um, share prices have been weak. Especially uh, compared to, the, to America. Uh, uh, compared mm. to, to, to other countries. Uh, and, and I think this is one of the great things that people have not really latched onto is, you know, where is the productivity growth gone and how do we get it back? Um, because although it's not everything, in the long term it's nearly everything. There's, a, there's an issue in there that needs thinking through, I think, and uh, returns on capital have been quite good in recent years, not so much on labour. And so a superficial glance at rising productivity in the economy would suggest that wages are, should be increasing more than they are, but in reality you're having a lot of work replaced now by investment in, in capital. I wonder whether there's not a, a real problem emerging here with the squeezing of tomorrow's middle class and, and resentment from young people when they can't get ahead. Yeah, I think, I think there is a problem with the middle class um, and I think it is being squeezed. And I'd put it like this. Um, we, we've, we've come through a period of extraordinary low interest rates and actually creation of money. Yeah. Um, if interest rates are low, the value of assets goes up. So that's actually been good for rich people. <laughs> Has that been fueled, by the way, by the printing of money as yeah. well? Yeah. So you have had inflation. Well, it's just that it's been you, in asset you've prices. Had, you've had a, a huge creation of money and the money has been priced at near to zero. Um, if, 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 if interest rates go down, by and large, asset prices go up. That's by and large what happens. Because people can borrow money cheaply and they bid prices up. So, so for rich people, um, this period of easy money has been great. Property's gone up, um, uh, not so much in Australia, but in America, the stock market's gone up. Um, it's been really good. Um, the middle class, I think, has been squeezed because um, wages have not been rising, but taxes have. Um, and I think we're getting to a, a worrying position in Australia where we've now got basically half of Australia that earns money and pays tax and half of Australia that doesn't. Um, and that half that earns and pays tax is having a bigger tax burden all the time. They are the middle class, they're people in jobs, their tax burden's been rising, their wages haven't necessarily been rising, they're not rich enough to, to have assets, and I think they are being squeezed. Um, you know, they're being asked to pay more and more in taxes, they're being asked to pay um, more and more in co-contributions to services, uh, and I think they are feeling um, a lot of pressure. Um, uh, and all the indicators will show you um, during our period of government, and it, to a lesser degree, but even subsequently, um, the, those in the lowest earning deciles have actually been improving their positions. Those in the top earning decile have been improving their positions. It's the people in the middle that haven't really been improving their position. And of course, uh, there's another form of taxation in a way, and it does have a, it, its genesis in many ways in government policy that's a, a, a source of a lot of heat and controversy at the moment, and I would say a great deal of feeling and not enough clear thinking, and that's energy prices. Yeah, sure. Well, energy. I mean, the, the government is, governments, you know, have deliberately gone out on a policy to, that, that, that has the effect of putting up energy prices. I mean, we, <laughs> we used to have cheap energy in Australia. It was predominantly um, coal-fired. Governments have decided to take coal-fired power stations um, or make them, make them uncompetitive you know, uh, through policy because they wanted to cut carbon emissions and energy prices have gone up. They've gone up. I mean, don't, this, this, by the way, I don't think was a, was a mere accidental 
byproduct. This was this was a very deliberate policy to make what was cheap coal-fired energy much more expensive, and people are paying for that. Yes, they're paying for that. And that gives rise to, in my mind, another great question. I think the confusion and indeed the obfuscation over the real objectives of energy policy over the last 10 years has helped contribute to the breakdown of trust in the system, but particularly in our parliaments and in our politicians, because people have not been prepared to go and spell out the intended consequences of their policies. I think that's true. I, I, I think that, that a lot of politicians tried to have it every way and tried to tell the public they could have it every way. That, that you could reduce emissions and there wouldn't be any cost. In fact, power become cheaper. Mm. You could have it all. Um, now, you couldn't have it all. Uh, and when it became clear that, in fact, um, renewable energy targets and the closure of uh, baseload power stations was making the grid less reliable um, and, and prices were going up, instead of saying, oh, by the way, you know, that's a deliberate consequence of this policy, that's what you've got to do in order to save the planet, uh, they said, oh, no, that was never our intention, yeah. that wasn't, in, you know, there's no connection. And I think people figure out there is a connection somewhere. They may not know how, but I think they have figured out there's a connection in there somewhere. Now, this is a critical issue as I see it, and I'd be interested in your views. Mm. This breakdown of trust, I think, is fueled by that refusal by too many of our leaders, too many of our politicians, to front the people who are going to be affected by their policy decisions. So, for example, if you believe that decarbonising the Australian economy is more important than the job of a person who works in a smelter works or in a food processing factory. Trust, if it's to be built up, maintained, built up, and it's critical to the future of democracy, surely demands that you go and look that person in the eye and say, I'm sorry, decarbonising the Australian economy is more important to the country and indeed to you than your job. And, and then, to the planet. Yeah. So, yeah, but doesn't that break trust? I mean, I, I, what but, I'm driving but, but at here is... They've tried to tell people that, you know, you can do all of that and there won't be any, any consequences. That's my point. Of course there will be consequences. Of course there will be. They were meant to be. Well, Julia well, Gillard confessed that the, the objective of her carbon tax was to change people's behaviour. That's right. When it was, became unpopular, oh no, it was well, all it was a dirty big... It was the big polluter's well, fault. Well, you know, I can remember when all this was being discussed. The, the, the Greens and the government were quite clear they wanted to um, close the Hazelwood power station which was brown coal, one of the biggest power stations in Australia, but it was brown coal, which is more carbon emission intensive than black coal, if you know. Um, and lo and behold, it was closed. And when it closed and all these people were thrown out of work, the government said, oh, this is shocking. Oh, we better go down. We better sort of do something. They, they should never have been put out of work. The object was to put them out of work. That that's, was the object. That's my point. It's breaking of trust. This wasn't an unintended yeah. consequence. Yeah. You know, the, the, the object of closing Hazelwood was to put yeah. all of those people out of work. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, I mean, I suppose if you're a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old, you, you can retry and do something else. But if you're a 55-year-old who's worked in a power station all your life, that's basically it. Mm. That was the policy. Um, and I, I, I do think, you know, this, we've sort of pushed this idea that all of these changes are somehow risk-free. I mean, there are risks. You might say the risks are worth it. Mm. Yeah, you could. In, That's a legitimate position. In the That's interest of some overriding, yep. Yep. much more important thing, these risks are uh, worth it, and we're very sorry, but it does yep. mean your job. But think of it this way, the planet will be saved. That's my point. But to say, oh, well, we can do all of that, and it won't cost you a thing. Mm. That's my point. This goes to trust, and I see trust as integral to a proper functioning democracy. We did things that were not popular, but we argued the case. We argued the broader interest. I'd like to believe yeah, we no, did. No, I think that's right. I mean, when you're introducing a GST, for example. We don't example, like it, but at least we know what you, you know, stand for. You, you couldn't hide the fact, right? That no, everybody, <laughs> everyone had a view. Yeah. You know, oh. tax on, on their goods and their services. Including you, their cakes. Including their cakes. You, you know, there's no point in denying it. That's yeah. the whole object of yeah. it. Now, that wasn't particularly popular, mm. right? But um, we could say at the end of all of this, you'll have a more productive economy, which will mm. give more jobs, better jobs, higher wages, da 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 
and 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 so so come with us on this journey. Now, as you know, we nearly didn't get there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, got, got yeah, there it was by very close. Bit. But but yeah. you know, there's no point running around and saying you know you won't have to pay the GST. Yeah. The whole object was you didn't have to pay the GST. Yeah. Now you look back on that change as the biggest biggest. I think it's the biggest legislative change I've ever seen in my lifetime because you're putting GST on everything. Well, um, you my. look back on it. It was obviously right. There's nobody in Australia who now says we should get rid of the GST. No more rollback. No more rollback. There's a lot of people that say it should be higher. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But but it, it just had to be done. And I I think you know what what is it that the politicians are in you know are, are deliberately trying to mislead people or maybe they're in denial mm. too. Maybe they they haven't thought through the consequences. Maybe they're not being open with the public because they they haven't thought through the consequences themselves that's possible well if it may be possible but that in itself i mean you know incompetence breeds distrust just yeah, as being too. dishonest does we have a right to expect i really do believe that i really believe we have i tell a right you the other thing i'd say to you though john is i think um these days there's a lot of people mistake um what I would call um, principles or um, promises for outcomes. Yep. I've always believed what counts in politics is the outcome. A lot of people say to you, oh, we had good intentions. See, we had good, we want to save, we want to save the planet. Huh? That was the most important thing here. I'd always say to you, and, and you know, make a promise about this, make a promise about that, you know. I think I've always believed, and I, I'd like to I'd like to see a lot more of this in Australian politics. That 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 in, intentions are no substitute for outcomes. Mm. You know, you can have the best intention in the world, but if it comes into a bad outcome for someone, that mm. matters. That mm. matters. The outcome matters mm. to a person a lot more than the intention. Wow. Well, you know, and yeah. you think to yourself, I mean, uh, you go back to something like pink bats in uh, in houses, right? Maybe it was. Great intention, right? But shocking outcomes, right? Because nobody actually did the work to say, in order to put our intentions into practice, we need the following safeguards, we need the following people to be trained the following way, right? Good intentions, shocking outcomes. What mattered? Actually, the outcomes mattered. Yeah. Much more than the intention. Let's, you're just on climate for a moment. No, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm a climate change denier. I'm concerned. I'm a farmer. We've had extraordinary seasons in recent times. The science on this, it seems to me, that you can get an incredible fluidity of views. But I'll tell you what matters here. We need to think clearly, and I think this is what you're saying, about the consequences of our actions. It's entirely possible, I think, as you and I sit here, uh, that in the interest of, uh, and talk about this issue, watching the debate at the moment, it's entirely possible that what we'll do as a country is massively damage our own economic interests, jobs and prosperity for no improvement. Very little outcome. Well, possibly <laughs> even <laughs> negative. What <laughs> happens if we close a whole lot of our industries? Quite, quite possible. And they are shifted overseas to places where there are lower standards. People mm. laugh at all. I don't think it's a laughing matter mm. at all. Quite possible. You know, the first quite possible at the end of all of that, you haven't made any difference to the to the outcome. Or you've made possible. it worse. But in all the meantime, possible. we've lost jobs but and industries you, you talk to and prosperity. Like that, they don't seem to worry about that, John. It's all about intentions, you know. And and I've, I've got to say to you, in politics, and I'd say not just in politics, even in your daily life, um, and, and I'd say to you, in, in politics but in, in life, and I think this is where the modern mind is going wrong. You know, people call virtue signaling. The important thing is to signal your virtue. Yeah. But that doesn't actually matter what comes out of it. But this is in an age of moral relativism, the triumph of feeling and emotion over thinking and reason. Mm. And I must say, it really worries me. Mm. And it worries me precisely because you're highlighting it beautifully here. Good outcomes for people requires clear, concise policy thinking. Now, to have a good public policy outcome, you need a high quality debate. Mm. Now, that requires a couple of things. One is respect mm. for the different views around the table mm. and a willingness to discuss them. Mm. But it also requires that you assemble the facts, that yep. you get to the bottom of the numbers and not just rely on what might make us feel good. I think you owe it to the public to do your homework. Mm. 
Really? I think, you know, the, the best representative, uh, the best government minister is the person that cares enough about them to actually do the work. And as I said, if you take the view, I'm not sure everybody does, but if you take the view, and I do, that the outcome is much more important than the intention. You know, it's, it's not about parading yourself as a person of good intentions. It's, in my view, it's actually about getting better outcomes for people. You know, on average, for most people, better outcomes. And we just seem to have lost sight of that. You're essentially an optimistic person. Mm -hmm. I think so. And again, referring back to your memoirs, mm. you made the point, uh, and I think it's a really interesting one, that, if I can put it this way, the machinery that our forebears handed on to us, uh, you know, our democratic traditions, uh, the legal mechanisms, the cultural institutions, are outstanding and fully capable, if used properly, mm. of taking the nation forward. Mm. Yeah, look, Australia, Australia has enormous advantages. Um, where, where, for example, um, a high trust society, that is, compared to other countries, there's a, a level of trust between our citizens. You know, I can trust my fellow citizens by and large to observe the road rules, respect my property, deal with me politely. You know. Um, this is this is part of our culture, part of our moral underpinning. Um, we, we've got a parliamentary system that d doesn't always work properly, but you know is better than most other forms of government. We've got respect for laws, um, and 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 these are absolutely critical for a successfully fun functioning society. Now, I think they're fraying. I do think they're fraying. Um, but, but again, you know, we, we started from a strong base um, and that's been very important for uh, the successful society that Australia's been. I mean, it's been a very successful society. You know, when you look back at it, it's given home to millions of people a much better standard of life for, uh, that they could have expected in their home countries. And not just material. And not just material. Um, and, and I, I do think the sort of framework and the culture and the values are very important to that. Um, you know, we need to be able to trust our government. Our government needs to be able to trust us. Uh, this is another point. You know, there's, there's no way, for example, the government could audit every person's tax return. You would spend more money trying to get the tax, right, than you'd get from the tax. So the government's still relying on the fact that most people are honest. If we get to a situation where most people are dishonest, we're gonna have a lot of problems in this uh, society. So we rely on the fact that most people are honest uh, in their dealings. If, 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 if that ever breaks down, then your government's gonna to have to become so overbearing, so strong to try and step in. And you'll be asking this question, can I, can I trust my government? As I said, we need the government to trust the people, we also need the people to trust the government. Well, as you know, all the research everywhere shows trust in our institutions is breaking down. So as you say, it's fraying. It's fraying. I think people miss the link between trust and freedom. Yes. If we trust one another to do what we ought to do without coercion, we'll get along a lot better with a lot less laws and a lot less intrusive estate. Yeah. As trust breaks down, we flee for security. It's human nature. Yep. If you won't do what I think you should do and respect yep. me, yep. and I think you're a threat, I'll go running for the rule book. Well, first of all, I might take it into my own hands. So the rule of law right, breaks down. Right, the rule of law breaks down. Or if I don't take it into my own mm. hands, you know, I'll ask some overbearing mm. government official mm. to do it. Yes, I, I need to be able to trust you to respect my freedom. Yep. Right? And if I can't trust you to respect my freedom, then then then, mm. then my freedom is 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 not guaranteed. It's it, it, I can't enjoy it. Similar, similarly, I, I have to uh, be able to respect your freedom. Um, and and I do think we're a lot. If you spoke if you spoke to people today and said, do you think you should be tolerant? Everybody would say, tolerance, you know, considered a very high virtue. 
in Australia, but but it's not that widely practiced. You know, no. there's, there's, there's lots of things that you can't mm. say anymore. Mm. Uh, yeah, we have all these mechanisms that tell us what we can and can't say and therefore what we ought to think, but they're missing the social media. Yeah, yeah, it's we, just gone mad. Where we, we see an enormous level of vitriol and hatred. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm, 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 I am worried about social media. Yeah. I think social media has unleashed some demons because every person now can publish any view on social media. Once upon a time, you know, if you read media, newspaper, watch the television, it had been edited and, and the extremes had been taken out and the violence had been taken out and the anti-socialist elements had been taken out. But on social media, there's, there's no editing. So any extremist can express any view. Um, and, and in fact, we know terrorists work each other up over social media. Um, and, and also um, negatives, trolling, um, can be disseminated so easily and so quickly. And I think it has unleashed um, a lot of demons. I mean, cyber bullying is very real for kids. I yeah, mean, we've, physical seen, bullying, we've seen suicides, literally. Yeah, physical bullying is bad mm. enough, mm. right? But now it's moved mm. into, into cyber. Um, and it, it appears to be even more powerfully negative uh, for, for young kids. So yeah, my impression is like all technology, technology can be used for good or for ill, but social media has brought with it a lot of damaging consequences. Well, Neil Ferguson argues that it may so destabilise the West that we become ungovernable. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah, and 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 mm. we we're now seeing the new mm. the new um, manifestation, fake news, um, which is just really a way of doing a cyber attack uh, through social media. Um, it is, I think, it's very worrying. And you know, I, I the other thing that worries me about um, social media is I think it's just narrowing the time span of uh, mm. the attention span yeah. of, of of young people. Young, younger people don't read books anymore um, because they're on their jolly iPhones. I tell you what, there's a great thirst for content. Yeah. And one of the reasons we do this conversation, yeah. is we, the conversations we're discovering, young people will listen to very long form interviews if quality content's there. Yeah. So I hope they're soaking up a lot of what you've had to say today. They say, what's this? Because <laughs> we're doing it for them. Um, but coming to those young people, uh, a couple of things. One is, I was amazed to learn that some, according to some Deloitte's research, around 92% of young Australians don't believe they'll enjoy the opportunities and the good lives that their parents and grandparents had. Mm. That's pretty disturbing mm. in a country like this, with everything going for us, mm. as you've said, with the machinery to take ourselves forward, whatever our differences, mm. if we can just be civil and engage in high quality debate and understand what we're doing, how did it get to this? Is it in part well? I, you know, I can understand it. I think many of them feel that um, uh, they're going to find it hard to buy a house um, if they're living in big cities. Their um, transport is crammed. Um, as I said earlier, they're going to be paying higher taxes, uh, and so I, I think for many of them, they they do think they won't be living the standard of living that uh, their parents and grandparents had. Now, I think, I think this is a big point, John. You know, Australia is an immigrant society. You know, we're, we're, we're one of those countries that was built through immigration. The story of immigration was somebody go to a new country for a better life. They might not get a better life, but their kids would get a better life. And if that starts to break down, if if this sort of idea of self-improvement and betterment, I think that will gnaw at the identity of the country. I think that will be quite damaging. I think it would be damaging for any country, but especially damaging for an immigrant country. The, um, you, you addressed law graduates at Monash recently, and it was, it was a very, very interesting speech indeed. And uh, uh, you encourage young Australians to exercise judgment and character and principle in their working lives and in the public sphere. They, they, you call them to behave nobly, mm. 
You went on to say something that I thought was really very interesting. You, you indicated again your dislike of populism, which you described as people advocating policies that they knew would not work. Mm. So you were making a plea for nobility and for integrity in people's working lives and in their public lives? Mm. Yeah, well, that does worry me about populism. That's, that's what I, how I would describe populism. Populism when somebody says we ought to do this, knowing that it won't work. Knowing, knowing that they're just doing it to play to the, uh, to the chorus. Um, uh, I think that can be very damaging. Um, well, let's, let's be frank, Peter. As you and I look at the political scene today, there's a lot of it about. Well, there's a lot of this, as I say, virtue signalling. Mm. There's a lot of uh, this intention, you know, uh, headline grabbing stuff and, and not enough delivery, as mm. I said. Um, I don't think there's any substitute for character. Uh, character is showing that you know, you can do the right thing when uh, when no one's looking. Yeah. Well, it's a good way of putting it. <laughs> That's mm. what character is. Well, Peter, uh, your involvement in public life would surely lead you to the point where I think you would say that we need to stop focusing on the things that divide us. We're very good at that. I can't believe the way we judge our fellow Australians if they have a different view to ours. We cast moral judgments for people on people having a different ideological perspective. Mm. What was it Martin Luther said? I look forward to the day, Martin Luther King, I look forward to the day when my children are judged according to the content of their character, mm. not the colour of their skin. Mm. We need in Australia to stop judging people because they have a different view to us. Mm. We're intent, it seems, on brawling with one another my great concern is we need to unify in the face of great global challenges. We've touched on economics. Mm. I'd be interested in your view on the changing global uh, geopolitical uh, well, circumstances. Well, uh, you, you know, the, the, the biggest thing internationally uh, at the moment is the rise of China. Uh, we, we have been in a world where there was only one superpower. A sort of unipolar. Yep, the United States. World, yeah. And um, China wants to rise and will rise as a rival. Um, I don't think it can be stopped. Uh, and how do superpowers operate? Superpowers project power. That's what they do. That's what makes them a superpower. And, and China is beginning to project power outside of China. Um, Militarisation in the South China Sea, for example. You know, loans in the South Pacific. It's beginning to look like a superpower and the existing superpower is engaging in, in, in rivalry. Now, how these two superpowers adjust to each other and how the globe adjusts, I think is the big issue. Uh, and how Australia adjusts, because we're in the middle of all of this uh, major economic power, uh, our major trading partner um, is China and our major defence partner is the United States. And, and, and I think this is really becoming a difficult issue for, uh, for our policymakers at the moment. So uh, that, that's going to be fascinating to watch. I think Australia is going to have to think, that, but think that through this very, very carefully um, uh, as, to, as to how we sort of nimbly pick our way through, uh, through these two elephants uh, and because uh, it's actually very unpredictable amongst other things we can't know how things might unfold it's very unpredictable um, and you know if you go back through history people will tell you that um, many wars have started um, because a rising power yeah, that's right. wanted to be recognized yeah. you know Germany first world war Germany second world war um, you know, rising powers want to be recognised as powers and sometimes they overreach and start wars. Um, you know, uh, rising powers do change um, the balance in, of the international order. And you've got a rising power here now of over a billion people. Uh, and it's becoming a major economic power and a major military power now. And, you know, this is a very, very difficult time as powers rise, how you accommodate them. I must say, I worry that we're not taking it seriously enough. For example, Vice President Pence has recently 
told the Hudson Institute that effectively there's a new Cold War because of China, as they see it, not playing fairly in their objective of being dominant in the Pacific at least, their interference in other countries, their surveillance of their own citizens, debt trap diplomacy. It's hugely important, that speech, hugely. And it's one thing that Democrats and Republicans in a divided America probably agree on, and yet we paid almost no attention, despite the fact that it may have enormous ramifications. For, you know, two examples of our complacency. We do not have our strategic fluid energy, liquid energy resources, uh, reserves in place. We don't have them, and yet all of our oil and refined product comes through that troubled part of the South China Seas. The second thing that amazes me is that 10 years on, when it was agreed by all sides we needed to upgrade our submarine fleet, <laughs> they seem no closer than ever. It's a long way off. Are we? <laughs> Those submarines. I mean, what I'm really raising here is, again, it comes back to this issue. You recently made the comment, mm. and I, I, mm. it may have been misinterpreted, mm. but you made the, what I thought was an important mm. comment, we need a better economic narrative. Mm. But I wonder whether, in fact, as Brooks put it about America, Maybe the real problem now is that we lack the cultural depth. He was talking about his culture. Uh, uh, 60, as he put it, 60 years of narcissism, of tribalism, mm. uh, of atomization leaves us unable to address the things that concern us all. Do we believe in ourselves enough as a people and in our freedoms and in our values to be realistic? Well, I think this is the thing about China is um, it, it has a very definite view of itself, of its place in the world. It has a high degree of cultural and ethnic homogeneity. Right? Um, it has a vision of where it once was, great world power, and it believes it will be there again. Um, the West, China looks at the West and says, we were here thousands of years ago. The United States is comparatively recent. We were a great power before they were even discovered. Um, uh, you know, the West, the West was extraordinarily successful uh, in the Second World War and, and in the Cold War, um, but it now seems as if it's losing a bit of its confidence, a bit of its leadership. Now, you've got to be careful because democracies generally um, are slow to be aroused, but when they are aroused, they can really they can really show definite purpose. And the Second World War is a classic example. Particularly America. Right. Britain, slow to be, America is slow to be aroused, but once they are aroused, right, you know, they can show great resolve. Um, but, you know, as of now, I, I, I agree with you, you don't get that feeling of resolve uh, in the United States or, or the West generally. The United States is talking about turning back inward. Mm. That in itself is a real worry right. for Australia. Right. I mean, they're sort of saying, you know, well, Europe, you've got to pay a bit more for yourself. And Asia, maybe you've got to pay some more. And Australia, well, you want to be defended, you better pay some more. You, you, you know, a lot of countries, including Australia, have been taking a free ride off America for a long time. Well, I think it's time it came to an end. In the, in the defence mm. area. And the Americans are saying, hmm. We're turning back inwards. You better bear some of this cost yourself. Mm. There's going to be another cost for us yes. that we're going to have to bear. So we will have to get more serious, I believe, about um, our strategic objectives, um, about our ability to project power, about our role with smaller countries that, you know, if, if, if they don't look to us, we'll, we'll look to China in, in our area, our, which is the Pacific. Uh, this is a very, very tricky time and uh, it's, it's made not just defence, foreign relations, but foreign investment much more tricky yes. in this country. Um, it's made um, cyber issues much more tricky uh, and uh, you know, I think, I, think, I think the country's got to wake up to itself because I think for a while we just took a free ride on the rise of China without thinking through all of the implications. We, we had a free ride on the, on the rise of China. We did very well out of China and its rise. Well, my comment 
would I be think uh, simply to firstly make the observation we need to believe in ourselves. Stop dividing. We have the most wonderful country on earth. We have something of immense value to hand on to our children that we want to preserve, much that we want to hand on. That requires surely we think through the possible scenarios because there are many of them. It's an unpredictable environment, but we need to think through the possibilities and then, if you like, order appropriately in terms of defence and defence spending where, where, and priorities. Look, and when you're thinking, when you're thinking foreign affairs and, and security as a country, you've got to look after your national interests. Where does our national interest lie? As a medium power in this part of the world, free society, relatively prosperous society, that's, that's, that's where you begin. Where does our national interest lie? And then you bring everything back from there, in my view. Thank you, Peter. It's been great. Uh, and uh, I personally salute you for the extraordinary contribution you've made to this country and its well-being. Uh, and that's an ongoing contribution. No, thank you very much. It was great to catch up with you again. Thanks.